It's time to go to the Lord in prayer. What a wonderful opportunity we have to draw near to Him. So we've had a chance and opportunity this morning to worship together. And now we have a chance to kneel in His presence or stand in His presence. I would encourage you, it would be wonderful if the church board, those of you that are here, could uh, come. Let's all stand for a moment if you don't mind, but every one of us stand. And if the board would come and kneel at the altar and represent Pastor Randy today, I think that would be a wonderful thing for us. And then if there are others, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Others would like to do the same. You're certainly welcome to do that as we pray for our pastor today. Father, we bow our head today and give thanks to you. So we are in this place. <laughs> we sense your presence here. We know, Lord, that all of us come as needy people. We are reminded that the church is somewhat like a hospital. People have been out all week fighting the battles of life and they come to this place today to have their wounds bound up and to draw close to the master, the great physician. So we love you, Lord, and we're thankful that you opened the door to us. We're thankful, Lord, for these who are representing our pastor today. We pray right now for Pastor Randy. We ask you, oh God, that this very moment he could sense your presence at work in his life. May he know right now, oh Lord, that he's being prayed for. May your spirit, Lord, be right beside the bed there. And may he be encouraged, oh Lord, knowing that you're there, knowing that you're going to see him through this. And knowing, oh Lord, that he's going to move forward with this and stronger than he's ever been in the past. And we're going to trust you with that, Lord. Lord, we're thankful today to be a part of a country where we are free and we enjoy our freedom. And we know, Lord, there are tremendous needs. We pray for our president today. We pray, oh God, you would be with him and encourage him during these days. We know that he doesn't have an easy day. We know that always, always, oh Lord, there are incredible pressures upon him. And the scriptures tell us to pray for those who are in authority over you. So we mind the scriptures today. We obey, oh Lord. And we pray for these families, oh Lord, that you know are separated. We're asking you, O oh Lord, to do what you can do and what you will do and what you would want to do, O oh Lord. The best thing for families, the best things for children across the border and along the border there. Lord, we think about this church and we know there are a number of people, I'm sure, that with sicknesses and issues they're dealing with. Some here in the pews, O oh Lord, who are facing dialysis, who are facing facing cancer treatments. Lord, we just pray for all these, those, Lord, who can't be with us today, those in nursing homes, those in uh, rehabilitation centers and hospitals. Dear God, may they sense this morning, even though we cannot call all their names, you can call their names, oh Lord. Stand by and be near. And Lord, we pray for those that are here. For some who are here whose heart might be a bit cold, oh Lord, I, I pray this would be a day when you would warm up the hearts and the souls of your people. For Lord, if there's some who are walking in disobedience to you, I pray this would be a day through the word, oh God, we would claim that and believe that. And Lord, for some who are troubled and carrying heavy, heavy burdens, we give them to you this day and we are trusting you. You never fail us, oh Lord. So we claim that. Have your way, O oh Lord, in our lives today. And may this service be one that the people would sense your sweet presence and your blessing, Lord, at work in our lives. We pray it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated there. Thank you. Glory to God. <clears throat> Around the throne the saints will bow and lay down every crown. How glorious that moment to see him face to face, to hear him say, well done, my child, you finished your race. But for now the sun's still rising, there's work to still be done. While we're waiting for the promise of what is yet to come, finish work.
is to be courageous, bold and full of faith. So wherever he may lead us, whatever it may cost, let the church arise and lift the banner of the cross. Ushers are ready. This is an opportunity for all of us to give back goodness that the Lord has shared with us. So ushers, please come forward. As we celebrate the giving. Dale, would you pray for us, please? Are you comfortable in doing that? Okay, then I think that maybe uh, Dale Gilbert is probably comfortable in doing that. No, he's not. Well, somebody get comfortable here. I will. How about let me do it? <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for these good people. And Lord, you know the needs here, the great needs in this church, as in all. And so we pray you would bless, Lord, as the people give today. And may we give as they applauded this morning, with great joy, because you call us and you give us, and the word is so clear, to give with a cheerful heart. May it be so in this congregation today, in Christ's name, amen. Good morning. What a wonderful day it is to be in the house of the Lord with our brothers and sisters in Christ. This week I was thinking of another song um, with the 4th of July coming that uh, maybe do a patriotic song. But the Lord had different plans. The Lord reminded me and saying that, and, um, most people know, but I know there's probably still quite a few, this is my 12th year out of ha having my liver transplant. I was on the waiting list for nearly two years. I was down to less than 5% function of my liver. Doctor said afterward that my, um, when I had received my new liver, I was probably about two months from dying. But I knew I was in God's hands. Even though waiting so long, I got discouraged so much. But the Lord would always wake me up in the morning with songbirds singing in my window, reminding me that he was there and that he was watching over me. And whatever problem, whatever comes your way that how hard things may be. You may be on your deathbed, but the Lord is, you're in the Lord's hands. And always remember that the Lord is watching a sparrow. And if the Lord is watching a sparrow, he's watching over you. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? 
Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he's watching me. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he's watching me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know that he's watching me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender word I hear and resting on his goodness. I lose my doubts and fears, though by the path he leadeth. But one step I shall see, that his eye is on that little sparrow. And I know that he's watching me, for his eye is on the sparrow. And I know that he's watching me. Whenever I am tempted, Whenever clouds may rise, when songs give way to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him for cares. He sets me free, for his eye is on that old sparrow, so I know that he's watching me, for his eye is on that sparrow. And I know that he's watching me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free.
Thank you. Good to know that we're always in the Lord's sight. He's always near. Well, this morning I want to ask you to turn with me to John's Gospel. And it just worked out today. Yesterday was my birthday, and so they scheduled me off in the office for uh, today. And when we got the call, I said, I want to go to Hernando. That's a fun place to be. And so uh, my wife was fine. We had a grand, a grand day yesterday uh, together. And so it's, uh, it's a privilege for me to be here with you. And together we're going to work together to see that in, through our prayers and uh, best wishes that Brother Randy will be back on his feet soon. Trust that. Um, when you look at the Gospel of John, we talk about the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means same. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels, and they call them the same. They, a lot of them have the same things, but here's the way that God has worked out the writing of all the 66 books of the Bible, and that's, he uses what we call plenary inspiration. It means that the Holy Spirit works through the writer. And so the writer's personality comes through too. And the writer has new insights that possibly the other writers didn't have. And so when you have the Gospels, John is far different than the other three. It's full of truth, that's for certain. But when you look at John's Gospel, it's the only Gospel that over half of John's Gospel was written about the last week of Jesus' life and then those days leading up to the ascension. Jesus knew, John, the, as, as, as indeed the Holy Spirit was at work in John's life as he wrote this, we know that Jesus was imposing or inspiring John that the church was going to suffer. The church was going to suffer like never before. And Jesus knew that after he died that he had to send the comforter. The birthday of the church is not Christmas. The birthday of the church is Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came, filled the hearts and the lives of people like a rushing mighty wind and lives were changed. That's when Peter was drastically changed and walked out into the street. It, it was Pentecost. It was this great holiday this feast time, and he preached to 3,000 people coming to know the Lord as their Savior. It's a powerful time. And so we look at the church, and the calendar says to us, Christmas? No, it's important. But the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus spent a lot of the time in the last half of the book talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's coming. The Holy Spirit filling us. Jesus even said to them, it's for your good that I go away. You're going to be better off that I'm leaving. And it, the disciples didn't like it when Jesus said that. But it's just like this morning, as I have a chance to speak to you right here in Hernando, at the Nazarene Church, at the Presbyterian Church, at the Assembly of God Church, at the Baptist churches here in this town, the Holy Spirit is able to be in all those churches at exactly the same time. And around the world, where when Jesus spoke on the mountainside, the Holy Spirit had not been freed as we know it now. And so the Holy Spirit was with Jesus on the mountainside, but Jesus had to go to all these places. Now, Jesus' his voice speaks through tens of thousands of people, Sunday school teachers, worship leaders, special numbers in song, choirs, ushers, greeters, on a day like this. And so when you look at Jesus talking to us about the coming of the Holy Spirit, it was critically important. Look at this passage. I want you to read it with me. Would you please read it with me? Here we go. If you love me, you will obey what I command. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. There's what we call the paraclete. Now, some of you might have a parakeet at home, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the paraclete. The paraclete of the teachings that Jesus gave us on the coming of the Holy Spirit. We start thinking about this paraclete five different times in the Gospel of John. Jesus starts promising the Holy Spirit and he starts defining what the Holy Spirit is going to look like when he comes. This Holy Spirit 
paraclete or parakletos talks to us about this coming Holy Spirit. Now look at this. He's one who's called alongside. We'll talk more about that. The Holy Spirit comes as a comforter. All of you could stand up and testify about that this morning in times, in days, in experiences, whether in your life or the life of someone very close to you where you were comforted by the precious Holy Spirit. Counselor, almost like someone who stands up with you in court. Attorneys, when you speak to each other or when they're spoken to, oftentimes or the judge will speak. He, he won't say attorney, he won't say esquire, he will say counselor, you may approach the bench. Advocate, wow, somebody to stand up for us, somebody to take our place, somebody to take our part. Helper, just that the word helper means so much to us. And supporter. Well, Wycliffe, this is what Wycliffe said a couple hundred years ago. The Holy Spirit was to fill a man with the spirit of power and courage which would make him able triumphantly to cope with all life. Jesus knew what was going on. Jesus knew that families would be separated in the early church, where children would be taken away from parents. Jesus knew that Christians were going to be used in Rome as people came into the city, impaled on these huge great stakes and thrown with fire, I mean, well, with oil, and then set on fire alive to serve as torches. This line, the long Roman road coming into the city. Jesus knew that there was going to be incredible suffering. What was interesting was he kept telling the people to hold on and hold on and hold on and get ready for this. And what happened was the church grew through the martyrdom of the saints because people said, if it's worth dying for, it must be worth living for. These were people like you and people like me who said yes at any cost to serve Jesus Christ. Well, Arnold Earhart wrote this about this. The richness of the meaning of paraclete makes impossible an inadequate translation for a single English word. We just can't translate it what it means for the Holy Spirit to be alive and active. Well, J.B. Phillips said, it's someone to come and stand beside you. Ronald Knox said, it's he who is one that's going to befriend you. Charles Barclay, I love what Charles Barclay said. When he talked about parakletos, he said it might be a person to give witness in a court of law in someone's favor. An advocate pleading someone's cause when under a charge which could result in a serious penalty. The word really means, which it sends fearful and hesitant soldiers and sailors into battle. It means one who puts courage into the faint-hearted. One who makes a very ordinary man or woman cope gallantly with a perilous and dangerous situation. The Holy Spirit comes to us and makes or takes away our inadequacies and enables us to cope with life. Well, we're going to look this morning at a few of these passages of Scripture in the Gospel of John that make up the paraclete, this meaning of the Holy Spirit in coming with us. So John 14, 16 through 17. John 14, we already read this one. But this says that He's going to come, and he's, if you look at there, He's going to be our helper. Do you see that in the third sentence? This helper that comes beside us. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may be with you forever. Jesus was a helper. Jesus helped the people. He made a difference. He healed the people. He encouraged the people. He blessed the people. But as Jesus walked those dusty, rocky roads of the Holy Lands, He could not be with everyone all the time. But the Holy Spirit, whoosh, has the ability. We don't even understand it. I don't understand how cable TV works. I don't understand how that works. I don't understand how thousands of people in the same neighborhood can be hooked up to that and there's enough power to push those. I don't understand. There's some cable TVs I think that have two or three hundred channels. I don't know. I don't know. I mean it's a cable that size. I don't know how that works but I sure like watching TV every now and then. And I believe that it somehow works because it's coming right into my house. I can't explain to you in a dignified, 
scholarly way today how the Holy Spirit works, but I can say to you, in your life, over and over again, you know He works because He has been there to help you. When we think about the Holy Spirit coming, Paul talked a lot about the Greeks, and during this time, the time that Jesus spoke of this, the Greeks were great fire, fighters and, and great warriors. And, and you've seen some of those movies where you'll see a couple of Greek soldiers with their spears and they're fighting, and they have like a net they're holding on to together, working together. And the Greeks, when they went out into battle, they never left their, or they, they always watched each other's back. They fought in pairs of two. And so with the Greek, they'd have a sword or they'd have a spear and they'd have a hold of this, this cord and they'd, one would be in the back facing this direction, one would be this one. And as they turned, they had 360 and when somebody was coming, there was no way you were going to get ambushed because back here is this helper and he's watching out and he's going to comfort and he's going to take care and he's going to make sure that he's protecting you as you are protecting him because he's got his back turned to the people coming from this direction. And you start looking at this, the Holy Spirit is our partner when we are doing battle. The Holy Spirit is our helper. There's nothing that He is unable to do. We look at Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this great Holy Trinity. All three of them have their responsibilities. God the Father, the great creator, sustainer of the universe. And the scripture said when Jesus ascended into heaven, He went and He sits at the right hand of the Father. Now this is very elementary, I understand. But as we pray, as we pray here, as we prayed today for Pastor Randy and you had people kneeling and standing around this altar, you back there were praying for Pastor Randy. We got through to heaven, I will guarantee you. And so we pray in the name of Jesus and those prayers are going to Jesus who's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus looks over at the Father and he says, all those people, Pastor Randy down there in Hernando, he's sick. You know he's got this encephalitis in his brain. He needs a touch. And as we pray today, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, and this is the way it works, that Jesus goes at the right hand of the Father. He goes to the Father on our behalf, and the Father dispatches the Holy Spirit. And He says to him, I want you to get down there to Pastor Randy because he needs a fresh touch. He needs to know that I am able and I am going to make a difference in Randy's life. That's the way it is as you pray. As you pray for your children. How does it work? As you pray for yourself. As you pray for a loved one. And you're praying and you're trusting. And you're holding on to God. And you keep praying. The old timers used to call it praying clear through. Anybody ever heard of that before? I mean you just keep praying. And you keep holding on. And you keep holding on. And you keep praying. And you keep bombarding heaven with that. Finally, as you pray and the Christ Himself senses that you are serious about it and you are desperate, you are praying, the Scripture says, fervent prayers. The Holy Spirit is sent out, is dispatched in your behalf through the power of Christ at the right hand of the Father. And whoosh, away we go. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Separate, but all one in the Holy Trinity. Let's look at the second one. He's teacher. I love this. Pastor Randy could be preaching a message on Sunday morning and you're sitting out there listening and you can point number one, yeah, boy, go, go, go. Point number two, and then all of a sudden he gets to point number three and you're thinking, I don't, I don't really understand what he's saying on that. I don't, I don't get it. And so you, man, one and two is great, but I, I just don't get it. And then about Tuesday or Wednesday, you're at work or you're sitting at a traffic light, or you're going through McDonald's drive through and all of a sudden, you're thinking about that third point, and it's like, brong, you get it. I'm going to tell you what, you're not smart enough to get it on your own. I'm not smart enough to get it on my own. But the scripture here says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Praise God. That would be what a shout. And will remind you of everything I have said to you. 
When's the last time you were reading your Bible and a verse jumped out at you that you had read a hundred times before in your lifetime? And it was like it was the very first time you read it. It's not been that long ago that 1 Peter 4.10, I was reading it. And I was just arrested as I was reading that passage. And it said that I had a responsibility that every word, he says in 1 Peter 4.10, every word that you speak, every word that you speak should be as if it was the very utterance of God. Hello, McFly. Think about that for a minute. That means that Christians can't say four-letter words, can they? If every word we're supposed to speak should be the utterance of God. We can't get upset and just go off on someone. Scripture tells us. 1 Peter 4.10. I read that and I read it again. And I'm sure I'd read it a hundred times, but I'd never really seen it. It was like that moment, I was ready, the Holy Spirit gave it to me, and I've not been able to get over it. What a difference it makes. He's our teacher. He teaches you during Sunday school class. He teaches you during a song that's being sung. He teaches you as the pastor. He teaches you as you're reading the standard, as you're reading the scripture, as you're reading your devotional guide. He's teaching us, and we claim that. New you know, it's exciting, isn't it, to have new truth at work in our lives. We need it. doesn't matter how old we are. Next, I love this. He confirms our faith. John 15, 26 and 27. John 15, 26 and 27. When the advocate comes, now think about this, the advocate, one who comes alongside to advocate for us. We don't know. Well, there's probably a lawyer or two here, but the rest of us don't know. We do not know. And the court, we don't know the procedures in court. We don't know the protocol in court. We don't know when to open our mouth and when to keep our mouth closed. And you go to court, you better have an advocate there. You better have an attorney there. You better have someone who has privileges to argue your case before the judge. Because most of us are incapable of doing that. And so we have the Holy Spirit at our side who confirms our faith. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you, glory to God, from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father. He will testify about me. Praise God. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. There's times when you need your faith confirmed. I was pastoring in Ohio, and uh, oh my goodness, the church that Debbie and I were called to was the church we grew up in. Pretty, pretty amazing. Swihearts were there with us. They were doing the youth work in those days. And uh, Sherman and Jean Swihart, members of this church. And we started, and we had our first Sunday, there was 130 people there. And, and Debbie and I were young, we had young kids, and, and we started reaching some of the friends that we'd gone to school with, and so, and, and just young people just started coming, young couples, and uh, people, um, they were popping babies out there, it was unbelievable, just all these little babies in the nursery, how to do things in the nursery, to enlarge it, and so on and so forth. There was a couple by the name of, of Randy and Becky Smith, and they wanted desperately to have a baby. They wanted desperately to have a baby. And they, I remember, They'd stand up and say, ask, we ask for prayer. They'd come to the altar and pray and ask God to help them so they could have a baby. And finally, she got pregnant. And it was, I mean, the whole church celebrated. I did a terrible thing. I made a mistake, a bad mistake. I've never, I've never done it since. It scarred me for life. I got so excited, I went to the baby shower. Men, don't ever do that. <laughs> don't ever do that. It's a horror. Don't. It's, I still, I get cold chills and I have to take pills occasionally for it. Long story short was, I get the call. She's at Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and I live about, oh, 40 miles north of there. And the call's not what I expected. The baby's 
going to be stillborn and she's got this little dead fetus inside of her and they want you to come to the hospital. Wow. I was young, didn't know what to say, but I remember going in that door, put her hand out and I held her hand and said to her, Becky, you're going through the most difficult thing in your life. And she said, oh, it is the most difficult thing in my life. But this is what she said. She said, this is the hardest thing I've ever dealt with, but if God can use me to help. Now, she was 26 years old. If God can use me to help someone else who's going through this, this is what she said, it will be worth it all. That is the Holy Spirit, my friends. We, don't have the we do not have the ability to deal with that. I will tell you, they, had two, they have two grown kids. They have grandkids now. God blessed and helped them through that difficult time. And she has continued to work with women. I saw her a year ago, and she's worked with hundreds of women who've gone through what she's gone through. So she was true to her word. Confirms our faith. She needed her faith confirmed as she was laying there. Uh, First American or first major league black baseball player was who? Jackie Robinson. Excellent. And anybody remember who Jackie Robinson played for? Good for you. Brooklyn. Jackie Robinson, it was a horrible thing. It was a horrible thing what he went through. Umpires were biased against him. Fans would scream horrible things to him while he was playing. When the bus would pull up at a restaurant and the team would get to go in, I was sort of traveling to another game and sat down at cloth, tablecloths, and fine china and silver. And Jackie would start to walk in. The manager or the owner of the restaurant would say, Oh, no, 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 boy, you will eat on the back porch today. While the whole team was eating. He was. <sighs> we look at that. He, he, there were many nights that he stayed in, slept in the bus while everybody else slept in a hotel. But he stayed firm and he stayed after it. He was playing in Brooklyn before the home crowd. And some of you know your history very well on this. And they was out there. He uh, played, went out, played second base, went after a ball and... Hard hit ground ball and went between his legs into the outfield, and the whole crowd started erupting. Boo, boo, boo. They had had this hate inside of them, even the home team, booing him, booing him, booing him. And Jackie Robinson didn't know what to do. Can you imagine everybody and your home team? And he just went over and stood up on second base, put his hands in front of him, bowed his head. He just didn't know what to do. There was a little shortstop playing beside him. Anybody have any idea who that was? Pee Wee Reese. Pee -wee Reese. White boy. Everybody was white on the team except Jackie. And Pee Wee Reese went over in front of that full house and put his arm around Jackie Robinson. And the boos went down and down and down and finally stopped. And all you could hear was the umpire, play ball! Jackie Robinson told his wife before he died, that was the most important and life-changing day of his life. Sometimes, when there's no one around, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. The Holy Spirit speaks to you to go put your arm around someone. Sometimes, when there's somebody in a struggling position at the grocery store, or somebody even the hospital foyer, whoever it might be or wherever it might be, the Holy Spirit speaks to people like you and says, hey, I want you to go and be my hands and feet. Well, the next one, John 16, 7 through 11, talks about conviction. This is wonderful. I, I love this passage because we need it. And we don't talk about it much anymore. Look at this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy, 
or the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. When I was pastoring that church, my home church in Trenton, Ohio, uh, I was late one night, about midnight, I got a call. And a guy's name was Jim on the other end of the line. And he had a family in the church. He didn't come. His wife and two children came regularly. His wife was involved in ministry there at church. And he said, Larry, I, I got, I got, I've got to pray. I, I've got to pray. And I said, well, sure. I said, meet me down at the church right now. And I remember going down there and coming in the side door. And he, he followed me in there. We went down and, and fell at the altar, gave himself to the Lord. It was a phenomenal time. He prayed and cried and went through that thing. I was so excited. I was a young preacher myself in my 20s, and I was just so excited. I couldn't wait till the next Sunday. I'm going to bring Jim up front, and boy, we're going to talk about his salvation, and the altars are going to be lined. I, was, I mean, I had it all in my mind all figured out. And Sunday morning, Jim wasn't there. He stopped by to see me on Tuesday. There were no cell phones in those days. We didn't know what that was. There was only Dick Tracy, and you just thought about it. You know, hello. And I said, Jim, is everything all right? Where were you? And he said, oh, he said, I've, I've been down to Kentucky. I said, that's where I was raised. I said, well, what happened? He said, I went down to the grocery store that I worked in in high school, and I went up to the owner of the grocery store, and I said, listen. I said, Jim. He said, yeah, it's me. He said, when I worked for you, I stole from you. And I've got money in my pocket. He said, I've given my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I've come to pay you back for what I took for you. And he, he named the man's name and he said, Jim, I knew that you had stolen from me. And all I could do was just trust the Lord to deal with that. I said, and here you are today and the Lord has dealt with it. Take your money back home to your family. I won't take a penny of it. I'm so thrilled you've given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He left there and he walked down to the barber shop. He said, I walked in the barber shop this was a hard one. I said to the barber, remember that big electric pole you used to have out front? He said, do I ever? He said, it came in one day and it was missing. Nobody's seen it since. He said, me and some buddies didn't have a reason for doing it. We were out one night, went and got some tools, took that electric barber pole, took it out in the woods, threw it, broke it into a hundred pieces. He said, it's a horrible thing we did. He said, I've got money in my pocket. I've given my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord's not given me any peace. I've got to pay you for that pole. He said, Jim, I'm so excited. You've given your heart and life to the Lord. Put your money back away, just knowing that a guy like you, as much trouble as you were in this town, has gotten saved. He said, it's worth it all to me. Just forget about it. Go on home to your family. I was talking to Jim, and I thought, yeah, you didn't need to be in church Sunday. <laughs> you were doing exactly what God called you to do. What we have now is, and I, that's, that's been a good while back. That's been over 40 years ago. Wow. But today, we don't talk much about conviction. But the issue is that it's still in the Word of God. And there are some things where God does not convict you to the point for past sins that He expects you to go and do some type of restitution. But there are some times when He does. And we're not going to have the peace that we need to have, that we could have, that we should have until we make that phone call or we write that letter or we drive and visit someone and we stand before them and say, the Lord has spoken to me, I wronged you and I'm asking for your forgiveness. The Holy Spirit convicts us. He also convicts us when we were saved. Man, I grew up in, I, had, I sat under the same pastor for 30 years. Well, he was there 30 years. I, I didn't sit there. Anyway, he was at the same church. With, it's the only pastor I knew growing up. And it was amazing. I don't know how he did it, but somehow God gave him a finger that extended out about 12 inches when he was preaching. <laughs> and he'd preach hellfire and brimstone, and he'd point that at me, 
I got saved probably 70 or 80 times when I was a kid. <laughs> Down the altar and praying and praying and crying. And you know, it just, we, we just have to come to this place, yeah. And even as, you know, I, I just turned 69 yesterday, goodness sakes. Even at this old man's age here, there's still times without realizing it or in the heat of a moment, I'll say something where I still need to make a phone call or I still need to ask someone to forgive me. The way that you're going to find peace with that is just to surrender. Surrender is not a bad word for Christians. Surrender is a good word because we are servants of Christ and we are surrendered to Him. All right. Last one's our guide and then we'll kind of try to wrap this up together. I love this too. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. Are you hearing this? We're talking about the Holy Trinity here. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he needs to make known to you. Wow. Well, let's close and think about this. Give me five minutes here. I, you know, we're going to try and beat the Baptist to the restaurant, all right? So just, just hang in here with me. Hang in here with me, all right? We do our best. How does it all work? How does it all work? Well, you can't just read it and say, yeah, that's true, I like that. Every, everyone has a throne inside of their heart. <laughs> and either you're sitting on that throne or the Holy Spirit's sitting on that throne. What do you want? Are you in control or is the Holy Spirit in control? And see, if the Holy Spirit's in control... Then you're, and we all stumble. We, we all stumble. We all have problems. We, everybody. We're human. We'll be human till we get to heaven. But in this, we let the Holy Spirit lead us. And we want Him to lead us. And we want Him to connect. And we want Him to guide us. And we want our hearts to be tender. But how, do, how does that happen? How is it possible? How, Larry, from this scripture to making that happen, I don't. it's like a quantum leap. I don't see how I'm going to make it. Well, let's look at that Ezekiel passage. Can we do that? I hope I put that on there for you. Oh, yes, I did. Okay, good. Now, here we go. Let me tell you a little story. Well, that passage is up there. True story. Uh, a doctor by the name of uh, Bill Hart. He's a heart surgeon, of all things. How about that? And he... But done, he's been involved in over 150 heart transplants. So he's, he's no dummy, all right? He also was a senator from Tennessee. And so Bill Frist was uh, speaking at the prayer breakfast, uh, the national prayer breakfast. And as he spoke, he started t talking about the people that he had been associated with, who he had helped in the surgeries for heart transplants. And Frisch said, there's something that happens with the heart transplants that most of us aren't aware of. That the heart and some other organs in our body have cellular memory. And they actually retain memory. Now some of you are looking, I, I was born on a dairy farm and you're looking at me like an old cow that says, I ain't going through that new gate. You know, just hang on, hang in here with me. Hang in here with me. And so people actually have habits after a heart surgery, a heart transplant, that they didn't have before. Or they have urges, or they have longings for things. Uh, Gail Shea wrote a book. She had a heart transplant. And, and Gail was with her in her doctor's office after the heart transplant. And it was time for her to move on to the next step. 
and her rehabilitation. And the doctor said, okay, Gail, he said, you're doing so well. And she had her two daughters with her. And you're doing so well, Gail, that you can go and do any kind of exercise you want now. I want you, you can ride bike, you can do whatever. She said, oh, I'm dying to get back in the pool. And the two girls looked at each other like. And so they just kind of listened. And then she said, oh, to, just to swim again is going to be phenomenal. Hey, doctors, that's the best thing you can do. Get out there and swim. And so they're riding home. And the, the girl said, Mother, what was that swimming business? And she said, I, I can't wait I to get home and get my bathing suit. Mother, you don't have a bathing suit. You're afraid of the water. And she said, I love the water. Stop and buy me a bathing suit. And she went and she started swimming and getting her heart stronger. And the girls couldn't stand it. They did something they weren't supposed to do. They started researching and researching and researching. And they found out that when their mother got her heart transplant, it was a young college student training for the U.S. Olympic swim team who got killed. Now, you can look this up. Don't look it up now on your phones, but look it up when you get home. <laughs> Cellular memory, and you'll see that I haven't lost my mind up here, all right? It happens with livers. I was preaching about this. Kidneys, I was preaching about, and I used this illustration, and a guy after the service came up. And he's, I mean, he was grinning from ear to ear. He said, I, I just got a new kidney. He said, and I'm eating things I would never eat before. I said, all right, that's, you, you, I'm going to take you with me so I can prove that it really works. So look at this now, and this is what makes sense. I will give you a new heart. Now this is Old Testament. This is hundreds of years before Jesus ever walked on the earth. And Jesus is speaking to Ezekiel, that grand old prophet, and he was getting him ready for the helped people so they could understand when the Holy Spirit really came at Pentecost so they could understand this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Anybody getting excited? <laughs> I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you, hello, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. <sighs> Jesus takes care of everything. He not only preached and taught and taught and taught on the coming of the Holy Spirit before He ascended into heaven, but He also, while He was up in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit, prompted Ezekiel to write this years and years before. My friends, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, it's a wonderful thing when you get saved. It's a phenomenal thing if you get saved. But there is an additional step in our salvation where we say, Lord, I know you've forgiven me my sins. Whoopee, I'm so excited. But you come to a place where you know there's more. And you know you need that next step where you come to this place where you just die out and you say, Lord, I've got you, your blood has washed me and washed away my sins, but I long and hunger for the Holy Spirit to live inside of me and to empower me and to lead me and to guide me. And, the, and as you pray that prayer, the Lord has a big smile on His face and He says, that's always been my plan, that not only would I forgive you of your sins, but the Spirit would live in you eternally. Have you come to that place this morning? Are you there? Let's stand together. Are you there? Are you at that place? Maybe some of you were at that place 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And as you'd be honest now, you just would say, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm as close. I don't know if I'm as obedient. I don't know that I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me like He really wants to in my life. I didn't plan to open the altar this morning, but the Holy Spirit is not going to let me not do that this morning. And so I, I just want, we're going to sing something. Breathe on me, breath of oh, God. Perfect, perfect. And as we sing this, as we sing this, maybe you could bow your heads right now. Is there anybody that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and you want all that God has for you? You want this new heart. You want Him to lead and guide and speak, speak through you. Is there anyone that's so hungry for the Holy Spirit to 
take control of your life that you'd like to slip out right now, eyes closed, nobody looking around, but you say, I, I want to come down to the altar now. I don't even want to sing the first word. I want to come. God's spoken to me. Is there anyone that feels that, that strongly this morning that you want to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to take total control of your life? Anyone? Anyone? Let's sing, shall we? Let's sing. We're not going to sing long. We're just going to mind God. If God is speaking to you, I want you to come and let's have a closing prayer together. presence here in this place. Thank you, Lord, for the promise to give us a new heart with cellular memory, memory of your Holy Spirit, memory of those things, oh Lord, that we need to do to please you. So we pray today that all these good people, may they realize, Lord, that at any moment, driving home, they can pray this prayer. Spirit of God, fill me. At home by their bed, they can pray this prayer. Turn off the TV this afternoon and pray this prayer. May our hearts, oh Lord, be renewed in you and may we live a life that will please and honor you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.